So my job is to keep the conversation moving, but also please be respectful of people speaking, and also respectful of the at his time, and I'm just here. So thank you. The mayor is not just here. He is doing a great job. Let's give him a round of applause as well. One three six, and and don't be shy if your number is called. Very often when I do it with the students, they get super shy. How about this one here? Hold on. One four six. Hold on, I just want to tell about people being shy. And one of the students said, "This Senate dude looks so serious. You think if we don't ask our questions, he'll come to our house?" The answer is no. We want you to feel comfortable. All over the state, we're having problems with these uh, questions of pollution of water systems. I was just in Prineville, for example, where I led the effort to improve the water sampling. So we will get on your matter right away. We've got staff people here. So if you would, um, what we'd like to do Anybody who comes with a particular account, and I consider these water matters very serious, number one. Number two, one of the best ways to get at them is by working with whistleblowers. I appreciate what you Sir, I, I, you're, you're getting a win, so let me just finish this up. We'll start right now working with you and following it up, okay? Thank, thank you, sir. Thank you. I look forward to it. We'll start right now. Thank you with your and question. Anybody who has something where government has kind of waltzed you around or taken you through a lot of red tape, um, you don't have to listen to me uh, talk all afternoon. We've got staff here. They're all over. Um, staff, can you just raise your hands so that we can... One, two, three. On both sides of the room, we have staff. And in fact, what we're going to do is people have questions like the important one the gentleman made about water systems. We'll just kind of gravitate to the closest place where uh, the person is who's asking the question. I'm particularly interested in hearing from whistleblowers. So the staff person who just touched base with the gentleman in the back is like five feet from you. And so if you'll tell her what your specific concerns are. One of the things that a whole group of people have come today to talk about this particular um, area, we can have the staff put together a joint you know, meeting. If I'm in town, I'll come. If not, we'll put it on a Zoom so you'll have a chance to talk with me directly. But um, the reason these water issues are so serious, and they are, is they go on for years and years, and the polluters really have the regulatory system as an advantage because for the most part the federal government doesn't have a lot of control over water quality. The states do. So that's why I've been pushing back so hard at both the state level and the federal level. Let's get together with you. We'll uh, perhaps have a joint meeting if other people are concerned. We'll get on it. One, three, six. And by the way, the reason these two speakers are talking about an issue that I've described as a priority is it doesn't get much more important than water. And if you've got you know, problems with your water and a sludge coming out of you know, places where you're supposed to have pure water the way we do in, in Primeville, that's priority business for government. That's public health. That's public safety. Question 136. Yes, thank you. I have one three six. Yeah. Uh, Senator Wyden, I listened to your interview yesterday on NPR, calling for an investigation of Sorry about the Clarence Yes, sir, I am. I believe that no one is above the law, and that's a foundational cornerstone of our democracy. I don't have a question for you. But I just wanted to say that I appreciate your leadership and view on this important issue. And I fully support you in your efforts. Thank you. What we're talking about... <laughs> several days ago, along with Sheldon Whitehouse, the senator from Rhode Island, I asked Merritt Garland, the uh, attorney general, to uh, appoint a special counsel 
to look into all of these matters surrounding Chief Justice Clarence Thomas with the gifts and questionable ethics stuff. I'm particularly concerned about the tax avoidance issues. Where did my friend go? Oh, here you are. The tax avoidance issues, and let me be real clear about this. Clarence Thomas got a $267,000 loan. It was not a gift. It was a loan to buy a 40-foot luxury RV. And my investigators on the Finance Committee that I chair seem to feel strongly that he has paid interest, but not principal. Under federal tax law, a loan forgiven, which is what we think this is all about, you have to pay taxes on it, you have to put it on your disclosure form, not on the disclosure form. So we're going after this. And by the way, people said, oh, is this politics or all the rest? Part of what Hunter Biden is dealing with are tax charges, felony tax charges. So nobody's talking about singling somebody out. We do it by the book. The Finance Committee is running a long-term inquiry into tax avoidance. Why I mentioned the millionaires getting caught under our uh, leadership, making sure that we have the funds to go after those people and collected a billion dollars. So this is serious business. And I will tell you also, with Clarence Thomas, there's another issue that I've not talked about really publicly. The pay, according to records that I saw yesterday for a Supreme Court justice in, uh, in 2023 was $273,000. I have real questions about whether these instances, certainly with Clarence Thomas, maybe others, where they're making more income on matters that don't involve the Supreme Court salary, but essentially outside gifts and the like. So we're looking at those issues too. The question I have is with the illegal aliens that are coming into this country you know, by the millions, the number varies by who, what you hear, 8 million to 10 million. And they're getting benefits of free transportation, free health. They're getting Medicaid. How is that going to affect this? And they're, they're stepping ahead of the veterans. And they're, they don't deserve anything, in my opinion. They don't deserve to be here. They should be, you know, deported. What do you feel about deporting them? First of all, the system is broken. Let me just like be very clear on that, number one. Number two, I strongly support legal immigration. My parents fled the Nazis in the 30s. Not all of them got out. My dad became one of the celebrated Richie boys, the German kids who were featured on 60 Minutes not long ago, who came to this country, joined our army, and dropped the propaganda pamphlets on Hitler saying that uh, they ought to give up. So I am a very strong supporter of legal immigration. Obviously, in a broken system, the question is, what are you going to do, or are you going to do nothing? Recently, a bipartisan group of senators, led by a very conservative Republican, James Inhofe of Oklahoma, perhaps the most conservative Republican in the Senate, put together a bipartisan reform package. A bipartisan package with many restrictions in the areas you just kicked off. Some of which I agree with, some of which I'm not so high on. I voted for the Inhofe package because I think this problem is so serious, you have to get started. There were restrictions on asylum, there are plenty of things. And I feel very strongly if we had gotten it to the floor, 
I would have done my best to keep it alive and passed it into law. I, I would have added, for example, help for these DACA kids, these kids who never did anything wrong, and they come to my meetings and they want to be police and join the military and stuff like that. But I voted for advancing here a few months ago the most conservative package for dealing with the issues you're talking about. And as you know, it became kind of a big issue among some Republicans and who was going to do this and who was going to do that. But I thought it was very important for the reasons you're talking about. You don't get a quibble with me about the system being broken. Quite the opposite. It's broken. And the way it's broken, it, it doesn't work for anybody. I mean, people who come here People who are undocumented and work hard, they're not going to get their social security, but they've worked. So the system is just broken. If we had passed the Inhofe legislation, and if it was put in front of me today, I'd vote for it again. Yes, sir. Am I not mistaken that uh, that would have allowed up to two million people, uh, illegal aliens in a year? Uh, the debate about how many and the like was um, not wrapped up, but the big issues, I mean, this was supported by the very conservative people, the guards on the border, their union, who, by the way, is not real wild about Joe Biden. So there were people who felt very strongly about the numbers and the rules who supported the Inhofe Amendment. And that was a big deal in my mind because I wanted to be responsive to what people who weren't political and guards on the border were saying. Next question. Very important topic, sir, and uh, suffice it to say there are a host of the details, but on the basic proposition that the system is broken, I'm there. The next question is 150. Thank you, sir. 110. No, 150. By, by the way, I think at one point I said Langford, excuse me, I said Inhofe, but I thought I said Langford. It is Langford. James Langford. 150, 133, 111, 137. 150. 110 was not in the last batch. 150, 15. 107. What? 107. I did not call 110, sir. Sounds like a ticket. Oh, 110 is after 157. <laughs> Sounds like a ticket scam. <laughs> We're going to get everybody in, okay? That's my hand right here. We're lucky to have the mayor. Let's so, go so 150, 151. One, 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 let's go with 110. Go, go to it, sir. Okay. The tall, Thank you, Senator. The tall Guys Caucus is well represented. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, with, with all due respect to the president, uh, I've just watched with growing alarm over the last couple of weeks as his mental acuity just increasingly becomes called into question. Uh, he, he seems to have a firm grasp of, of policy, which I'm glad to see. Uh, I think that bodes well for the rest of his, his term. Uh, but I have concerns going forward about the implications for democracy uh, 2025 and beyond. Uh, I know that one senator has already come forward and call for him to step aside. Um, I just wonder what your bar is for uh, for the president going forward. Uh, what I, I just have concerns. God, I'm, I'm surprised that it took four or five questions. <laughs> I now want to clap if you don't like the answer. Um, we decided, sir, almost 1,100 town meetings ago, I'm almost there, that we had to keep these official town meetings where we are using congressional staff, congressional employees, your employees, out of the debate about elections and who's going to get in and out and all the rest. I understand the enormous interest in exactly the topic you're talking about. You deserve to have every elected official or certainly every member of Congress tell you where they stand. And what I'm going to do, because it's my first of four meetings, is make you an offer that at the end of the meeting, on my way out, well, I'm happy to um, 
um, tell you what I think, and it is an extremely important issue, and uh, I don't want anybody to think that there is some kind of plot or something to not say something. Quite the opposite. I, I'd be very interested in talking about it, hear your thoughts. We just, I, I don't want to run the risk of setting a precedent for all the rest of the town meetings, and then suddenly becomes like a party central committee meeting. Okay, great. Thank you for being here and your patience. Peter Greenberg, uh, two questions. One if the first one doesn't count. Can you discuss the 2025 agenda from the Heritage Foundation? Horrible. I mean, the 2025 paper by the Heritage Foundation would just turn back the clock in terms of core American values. I'm stunned that a group that calls themselves conservative wants to expand the state in the way they you know, wish to and micromanage you know, the federal bureaucracy to try to get a bunch of ideological trophies. And uh, I think it is a very appropriate issue for citizens to be debating right now, and we'll leave it at that. But it is, it is turning back the clock. And there is, there's a lot to look at. I mean, I'm looking, for example, at comparing the statements of the new judges other than Judge Brown, with respect to what they said when they were under oath. They said, those judges, they said that um, Roe versus Wade was settled law. Those words, not mine, Roe versus Wade, settled law, went out and, you know, overturned it. They said that nobody was above the law, went out and said that, you know, the president has the power to do practically anything if he can call it an official act. So these are some serious policy questions, and we're digging into them, and, Maybe that can go into stuff that gets talked about in the political setting, too. Uh, Green Senator uh, Yvonne Campbell from Corvallis. I know this is a very hot issue, very topical and emotional, but I'm just going to try to be very neutral. But I'm very interested in your continual support for President Biden's mass support of Israel and huge amounts of money going to weapons that are causing a genocide of Palestinians and a major national security risk by Bibi's support, uh, Bibi's statement that he is going to start bombing Lebanon, or if it hasn't started already, which could risk the retaliation from Iran. How do you justify I think this is an enormously important issue, and, I, and I'm going to walk through the topic. It deserves a real um, discussion and a back and forth should people want to uh, continue it. I think you meant to say at the beginning you have disagreements with the president on his policy. Is that right? Yes. Yeah, okay. I am a first generation Jew. My parents fled the Nazis, I mentioned that. My dad was in our army. Uh, he was, in effect, a spy for the United States, trying to ferret out information about the Nazi military patterns and um, the like. If you go to the Holocaust Museum, you'll see a picture of my dad's unit, um, now quite celebrated uh, by the Congress. My dad's in the corner, the guy smoking the pipe. We Jews grew up with, on our mind, the phrase, never again. And last fall, what happened through that whole idea out the window? The brutal attack by Hamas in October of that year said, yeah, again. The brutal slaughter of innocent Jews. You've seen all the accounts and the rapes and horrible human rights abuses. And what is even more god awful than that is Hamas keeps saying that they'll do it again and again and again. And amidst cries of river to the sea, no Jews. That's the objective. Now, 
Having said that, my job is to stand up for all humanity, all innocent humanity. I've been to the Middle East a number of times, not as often as some senators, but a fair number of times. And I always say, I gotta find a way that helps the Palestinian mom and helps the Israeli mom. They're both suffering. The Palestinian mom, the Israeli mom. So that's why now I'm working right now very hard for a two-state solution in the region that acknowledges Palestinian rights to exist, Israeli rights to exist, number one. Number two, I have disagreed very strongly with Bibi Netanyahu, strongly, and I have for quite some time. Bibi Netanyahu walked the halls of the Congress urging American senators to vote for the Iraq war. It's a really tough issue. Support was very high in Oregon for going after Hussein. I think there are about 20 of us left who voted against what Bibi Netanyahu wanted and voted against going to war in Iraq. And I think we probably agree that the world would be real different had we not launched that war. So, two-state solution, disagree with Bibi Netanyahu. I've disagreed with the Biden administration, apropos of your point about handling. I thought that idea of using the pier was really absurd. I thought there was no way it was going to get in. The humanitarian toll is devastating. Devastating. And we know that Hamas uses some of it to hide behind. So, uh, I appreciate, and I, your statement is very thoughtful and important. I appreciate any and all efforts to get the hostages out, to get the humanitarian aid in, and to get a two-state solution. That's what we need to do. I don't think Bibi Netanyahu is advancing that agenda. Most of what Bibi Netanyahu talks about seems to be good for Bibi Netanyahu. Doesn't seem to be good for those of us who walk into this. And as I say, I've always, before October of last year, when all of us tragically saw what we thought would never happen again, I just said, put my blinders on. The Jewish mom, the Palestinian mom, they want their kids to be safe. They want an opportunity. Look at what's gone on in Gaza. And Hamas, Hamas doesn't have the interests of the typical Palestinian. In other words, Bibi Netanyahu looks out for himself, and Hamas people look out for themselves. Who's going to try to step in? And that's why I've got the Senate man, I've got the Senate Finance Committee staff working hard on the two-state solution, so that we can have something to show for it that is concrete and real soon. Oh, and I also want to recognize school board um, member. Pete Morris, I spaced it earlier, so thank you. He's a yeah. like another, another one with big, big perks. Give him a round of applause. So what's your Pete, you're, you're going to make sure everybody knows about the mental health stuff that's available in September, right? We'll be working with you. I'm very excited about that. What's your number? Uh, 140. Thank you. Thank you, Senator White, for being here this morning. Um, I was going to ask a question that's already been brought up, so I'll just ask something related to it. Um, and that was the investigation into Justice Thomas. But I'm wondering, just as citizens, what are the things that we can do to make sure that our Supreme Court is run with ethical standards? Because I think that's a real concern right now. Well, I always say, that political change is hardly ever top-down. It's always grassroots up. And we're not here electioneering and stuff, but I think this is fair to say, <coughs> this is one of the things people ought to be thinking about in the months ahead, because I just couldn't believe the immunity provisions and, and for example, taking classified documents out. Folks, I'm on the Intelligence Committee. 
I may be the longest serving member of the Intelligence Committee in American history in the Senate. And uh, my older child often calls up and she wants to kid me a little bit and she goes, hey dad, what's going on on the so-called Intelligence Committee? <laughs> well, I'll tell you one thing that's not going on is taking classified documents out. Without going into it, we have a very rigorous system. I'm not going to go into it. We have a very rigorous system about not taking classified documents outside. So those are the kinds of issues that I think we ought to be talking about and I'm talking about and I'm not going to get into classified discussions with my colleagues at the prison. I will tell you that there are certain kind of core issues that go right to the heart of our responsibility as citizens that constitute policies. And for example, what happened on January 6th is such a thing. I was on the floor of the United States Senate then. I saw them whisk everybody out of the room. And for some of my colleagues who are older, it was a real challenge. It's no secret that, uh, that Senator McConnell uh, has some childhood you know, illnesses and the like. And what I thought about as members of the Senate were let out, and I can't talk about where we went and all the rest. All I thought to myself is, this is the kind of stuff that goes on in other countries. This doesn't happen in America. This doesn't happen in America. And I hope that we'll get back to that and um, tell you a little story, a little bit of history. There's a wonderful phrase that has been attributed to Winston Churchill. Historians, big historians, historians debate. Where Churchill is supposed to have said, the Americans always get it right. And he pauses and he says, after they've tried everything else. <laughs> <laughs> but the point is, that's where I want to go. We'll have differences in America. No question about that. That's the beauty of what the Founding Fathers thought about. It's why this was such a good meeting. You know, the Founding Fathers really thought the First Amendment was more important practically than government. Because people could talk. And we've got to get back to saying we have plenty of differences of opinion. But we have certain core values. What, we, what went on on January 6th outside our court documents? Okay, I've got a mom issue. I've got two grown sons who will not have kids because they cannot afford both the rent and the child care. They have to choose. So no grandma for me. My question, that aside, relates to the SECURE Act. 2019, where my husband and I... We're talking about the retirement package. Yes, yes indeed. Uh, my husband and I worked under the rules that were in place up until the moment that the SECURE Act passed. Put all of our eggs into the basket that the government provided for IRA and uh, passing along what we've saved over our lifetime, which, which isn't a huge amount to our children. And the SECURE Act came along about the time we both retired and the rules changed and now the funds that we've saved our whole life are being chewed on by uh, taxes. They have to take the whole thing all at once. There's no stretch. And I understand that the boomers passing along their money uh, is a big pot of change for the tax base. You know, you want to scrape in as much as you can of that. Is there any possibility that this could be revisited? And, I don't know, make tax brackets for that. You're taking our little bit amount of money that we saved our whole life for our kids, and you've changed the rules at the moment where it matters. 
there's got to be, you know, billionaires and millionaires that are using the same strategy. But that's not us. We're the little guy. It's all we had to give to our kids who are already giving up so much. Ma'am, you're talking about something that's very serious. And we have Cracker Jack lawyers who really get in to the details of it. And one that I and my colleagues on the other side of the aisle, because this was a bipartisan bill, is we said change is to be prospective, not unraveling something people have saved and worked for and the like. So let me do this. Let me under promise and tell you I'm going to get right on it because this is, um, I do get a fair number of questions about secure, um, but I've never gotten a question that the most recent changes, and there were changes with respect to IRA, took middle class people who had been saving on the basis of one set of rules and suddenly undermined them and they lost money and the like. So we will um, brief. Uh, Drew is the one who handles this in the DC office. He is a veteran, pensions, retirement, savings person. I'd like Drew to set it up. And if I can get on the call, I'll get on it too. But Drew, I would like to have called this nice person. He's my lead guy. He's considered one of the foremost experts on this in the United States. And I want to get to the bottom of it. Drew, Drew will give you a call. Bree, why don't you be on the call too? Because Drew is one of our sharper, sharpest young stars, you know, who's going to be doing a lot of good stuff in this area. And look, we're going to get to the bottom of it because I know that a bunch of times, and this is, I think, the role you want for the chairman of the Senate Finance Committee when they come from Oregon. You don't want me trying to micromanage every dotted I and every cross T, but this was a clear statement joined by the Republicans that we weren't going to unravel rules on people modestly, you know, say there are changes that, um, say, for the billionaires and the like, there are going to be changes for, for, for the future. And, um, right. Well, Drew, we're going to have Drew call you and we're going to have you walk through exactly what it is and that way you'll get a private session with our best guy, okay? Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Okay, next question. Well, I, I want to just touch on the gentleman's point. He's concerned about the executive branch. And let me kind of teeter around the outside of some of what concerns me. I'm the author of the law that broke 50 years worth of gridlock on climate change. For 50 years, for 50 years there had been exactly zero federal policy. I'm going to be very specific. No cap and trade, no carbon tax, no regulatory kinds of approaches, nothing. Going back to Pat Moynihan and Richard Nixon and the like. After cap and trade went down in 2010, I spent the better part of a year, my wife said, you don't even know where my husband is, he seems to be in some attic somewhere studying something, looking at how to proceed from there. And what I decided, I was a pretty junior member of the finance committee, wasn't chairman, wasn't any kind of. My wife says big cheese. And I was struck by the fact that there were billions and billions of dollars in tax breaks for various energy things. Much of it were monuments to yesteryear. And I woke up one day and said, I'm going to try and throw this thing in the garbage can. And I got pretty darn close. We now have a law that says really two things. We're going to have technological neutrality. One, we're going to have voluntary incentives, two, but we're going to say for the first time, the more you reduce carbon, the bigger your taxes. <coughs> first time. We estimated about $400 billion worth of private investment, which everybody thought was, oh my god. Most of the private analysts now say we'll get $600 billion or more because the private sector sees this as a good investment. 
radium, solar, wind, geothermal, variety of EPOPs, you, you name it. Without going into it too far, I'm very concerned about what can happen in the executive branch in the years ahead. Will an executive branch unravel that? Am I concerned about it? Very, very concerned. Already, there are people with election certificates who show up at home and talk about how great the program is, and they were opposed to it on the floor of the Congress. So, yep, executive branch. I'm going to get a lot of my time watching for rear guard actions that we're going to need to guard possibly against. We'll see. Thank you, Senator Wyden. But having spent, took me 10 years to get that done. After I wrote it, Senator Manchin invited me to West Virginia. All the critics hooted, no, nothing will ever happen. We agreed to reward reducing carbon emissions, technological neutrality, and the like. And ever since then, we've been implementing it. And I think one of the lessons that I'm proudest of is that incentives properly written with an end game like ours, which is you get your bigger break if you reduce carbon more, I think there's an opportunity to build on that in the future. That's what I'm going to be trying to do. But for example, you've probably seen there's a big debate on permitting. I'm going to try to bring some of the incentives that we used um, on the tax side. It's, it's not easy because permitting is on the regulatory side as opposed to taxes on the tax side. But I'm sure I'm not going to give up on it. I think there's, I think there's, there's a path to get that done. And we've got to because if you don't increase trend, if you don't increase the ability to build these geothermal plants and solar plants and wind plants, all the speeches about how you care about climate change don't mean anything if you aren't going to get it done. It's a longer answer than you wanted. It's such a good question. Thank you, Senator.